Okay, so I ask you to pull up a ch pull up a chair by the fire and share some Pervavlik uh, stories and secrets. So listen, our uh, surgical colleagues. It doesn't take much to really make them super happy, right? Every stitch they do this, and no wonder it takes three and a half hours to do these things. Uh, they have like some ego issues. They need constant, you know, like you're wonderful, don't worry. No, it's not you, it's bad tissues. Sewing margarine to tissue paper, wet tissue paper. It's for sure the patient's fault. So anesthesia says there's a paravavular leak and then you get uh, this type of response. I can't, I can't go. I can't go back on pump. Uh, that, that won't survive. Uh, it'll be okay. We'll give protamine. The protamine makes it better. <laughs> so um, surgery is glamorous, a big show, and uh, unfortunately, part of our job is uh, cleaning up after the show. So about two to ten percent of AVRs, seven to seventy percent of MVRs, have uh, significant paravalvular leaks. Uh, Reoperation has an extremely high mortality, 12 to 37 percent. The risk factors are mechanical valve, mitral position, angular calcification, infection, suturing technique, size, and shape of prosthesis. This is a um, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. And the things that I would share for you are, again, this 15 percent, 12-month mortality for people who undergo percutaneous paravalvular leak versus 12 to 30 percent, 7 percent with surgery. 18% deployment failure, 31% persistent leak in hemolysis, and 52% uh, clinical failure rate. Uh, what are the principles of kind of conducting the procedure? The patient should be inoperable, uh, inoperable or at substantial um, risk of redo by an experienced surgeon. The symptoms impact the quality of life. Reasonable expectation repairs are going to improve the quality of life. Refractory hemolysis that's transfusion dependent. And the patient often understands that there's going to be no uh, surgical bailout. I have to tell you that over the last, we've been doing this since 2002, we've had one patient who went to the OR acutely. So that's not very a very common thing. So planning starts with understanding the TE and Wendy, who unfortunately had to go to the Canadian ECHO meeting, which was also at the same time, which we didn't know about, uh, gave a great talk on understanding the TE. And the point that I would make um, is that, again, when you label, when you're looking at the mitral valve and you communicate with your echocardiographers, you put the aortic valve on top, that's what they call the surgeon's view, and they label the clock phase from 12 and go clockwise. When we look on fluoro in the LAO caudal, you got to label it the other way. Actually, I gave away my uh, thing. So I'm not a surgeon. Um, this is not a surgeon's view. The Rosetta Stone for this is, and this is the paper from the Montreal Heart Institute, that you actually need to label going the other way. So if they say, we had a great fellow who used to prepare these uh, diagrams before every paravalvular leak case. So he would mark off on echo where the leak was and how much of the annulus was involved and then would kind of give us a fluoro diagram about where exactly we should be looking. And you know we started this about five years before there was a 3DTE and I can tell you and also before there was a deflectible sheath and I can tell you that that was the most miserable procedure ever because it would be four and a half hours, low chance of getting across, a lot of fluoro, uh, and this is really, I mean, I did a case two weeks ago that was 15 minutes of fluoro time for a left and right heart catheter paravalvular leak. Things are really revolutionized. Now, you do have to focus your echocardiographer because very often at a critical point of the procedure, you'll look over at the echo screen and they have like some uh, 3D Q lab uh, thing they're working on that they're just trying to understand the ASD and like the device is just under the mitral valve. So that's sometimes a problem, but if you can focus them at the end of the procedure, that's actually uh, very handy. Uh, and really the view that we want to work in is really something like this after we do the transeptal. And then you just follow the tip of the deflectible sheath, move down towards the valve. Um, what do you need for this? So usually you'll get arterial and venous access. Um, you know, I do all our, our transeptals just using an SRO sheath, but I'm sure there's many ways to do a transeptal, many different types of equipment. Um, I fish for the leak with a four French glide catheter and usually a straight glide wire. Um, 3D imaging, orthogonal floral plates for targeting. Um, we don't really create an AV loop anymore, although we have done that in the past. And I'll go through some different things. I'll just ask a question. So what's the advantage of using a regular 035 straight wire versus a glide wire in paravalvular leak closure? 
There's one distinct advantage. Sammy knows. Yeah, because you can actually see the wire. It's very hard to see a glide wire on echo. And so if you're really having trouble with visualization about knowing your approach or why you're not getting past, sometimes it's worth it to just take a straight regular wire and probe with that because you see that very, very well on 3DT and you kind of know why you're missing. Um, we do all of our transeptals with imaging. Um, you know what I mean? I'm uh, a little bit younger than John. Uh, <laughs> Uh, back in the days uh, of uh, Jurassic Park, uh, where you can just take the needle and ram it into the septum there. I didn't, unfortunately, gain that experience, and so uh, I have to use imaging. Uh, we definitely like to tent, and we definitely like to know uh, where we're going, and we definitely want to go posterior, and we definitely don't want to go too high. If you go too high, you make your life very, very difficult. Um, so you definitely want to tent, know where you are, do a safe transeptal, then give your heparin. Um, the Bela system is really good for resistant septums, but I have to say I haven't used it in about three years and I haven't really found it necessary. Um, we do a balloon septostomy for every case. So when I say a balloon septostomy, we dilate the septum with a balloon. And the reason for that is if you need to get two sheaths across, for example, you get into a situation where you have a large hole, you've put down two wires, you want to get a second sheath across and your position is tenuous you don't want to get into trouble getting through the septum and lose a tenuous wire position. So you'd like to have some space to work with. The flexible sheath has made this completely like a different world uh, for us. That and 3D have just totally changed the landscape from when we started doing this. Um, we usually start with the medium curve. I don't know what other people do, but the medium curve usually, if you do your transeptal fairly low and fairly posterior, is going to sit, you know, half a centimeter above the annulus. And you can just push, pull, torque. If you do MitraClip, you know exactly how things work. As a matter of fact, uh, you know what I mean? It's there, there's a lot of cross-pollination between MitraClip and knowing how to use a deflectible sheath just to get your angle, your trajectory, etc. cetera. Uh, biplane can be very helpful, uh, especially early. I have to say, earlier in your experience, I have to say that generally speaking, we work in this REO cranial view where you actually see the valve uh, end on fairly well, which is this. So you set up this projection. This projection was more helpful when we didn't have 3D and was kind of hard to understand where you were around the annulus. Generally speaking, a four French glide catheter, if you can get a wire across a slippery wire, the four French glide ca catheter follows everything and you can generally get it in. If you struggle with the four French glide, it's going to be very difficult to get a sheath through most likely. And that's a message. So you have a small leak with hemolysis and you get a wire across, you can get the glide across, I have a default strategy for that situation. The other thing is, is that if you really need to push, there's a couple of ways you can do this, right? You can put a stiff wire in, and then you can take the agilis out, because if you just have standard sheaths, and you don't have the length to get through the agilis, you're not going to come out the end. So what you need is extra long, six friend shuttle sheath. That's one piece of equipment that works that you can actually keep the agilis in because then you have the support with the wire to actually direct you to give you pushability to get through in tight situations. It's extremely, extremely helpful. We used to do this snare and exteriorize. So you think you're going to get more support, but in fact, usually what you do is you get a stiff wire that's pulled up between the mitral and aortic valve, and it's difficult to fix that problem. You can try and put a multipurpose in from the groin and kind of push the wire down, but more often than not, this is not necessary. Basically, a technique we've abandoned. Um, advancing a stiff wire through the four French glide, it's very easy to, to lose position. And the same thing is when you put like a Lundercus wire through a balloon wedge catheter to a pulmonary valve. So you want to actually do that maneuver in a measured haste type of way. You want to kind of get it out in one go so you don't kind of push it halfway, it prolapses halfway, you push the rest of the way and it comes out. If you didn't dilate the septum, you have some resistance putting the sheath through. Um, if the guide catheter gets hung up at the annulus, a very helpful thing to do is you push the dilator through and then spin the sheath over the dilator. And that actually works better than trying to get the whole thing through. Um, also, using a long shuttle sheath, I think, is actually probably the way to go. Um, when you get a, a guide across, if it's a large defect and you think you're going to need more than one device, put two stiff wires through 
and you can put a catheter over each wire. There are different techniques to doing this. Some people, if they think it's a big hole, they'll get an eight French sheath across and you can actually put three little devices through that one eight French sheath. They won't be able to all fit in the catheter at the same time, but you can push one out and then push another device beside that one. It's not a, not a way of doing it that we favor, but other people have done that. What's the best device to use? So the United States still does not have the AVP3, is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So I've heard from many people that they think that the AVP3 is a panacea. I don't use it anymore. So we use it in many cases. I think there's a design issue there where there's a thin waist on the atri between the atrial disc and the body of the device, and you don't get enough device stuffed in the hole. And so my preference is not to use that. Many people like the AVP2. My preference remains the Amplatz or duct occluder as my primary choice uh, because I think you get metal in the hole, and when you get metal in the hole, it clots and it's finished. That's it. This is a patient who has four or five devices uh, put in this thing and is still leaking rather severely. Um, I think something that's really changed it for us is the, the, the cases where you have this, the patient who has refractory hemolysis who has a pinhole leak that's oblique uh, through the annulus has been classically a disaster to cross and more difficult to treat because you get the wire through and then nothing will follow it. And that four French glide and this AVP4 which goes through a diagnostic catheter um, is really very helpful for those and we, we've had good success in the last several years in, in using that since this device became available to us. Sometimes if you choose the wrong device you have problems. So this is a VSD device. The problem is is that if you take a double disc device, and this is why I like the duct occluder, if you take a double disc device and you pull the disc apart, the waist gets smaller. So what you think you need, you're not getting. The nice thing about a duct occluder is, as opposed to the AVP2, it is very hard to pull it through the hole. One of the most frustrating things to do is, you're snugging it back, snugging it back, and then you just go a little bit too far, and then you're worried you're unstable, and then you're like, ugh, and then it just flies out, right? It has no guts to it, the device. A duct occluder has enough guts that you can really snug it up on the bottom of the annulus, and the top of it will just expand into the hole, and you don't have to worry about kind of that traction making the way smaller. I don't know if that's been clear, but I think that's been our experience. This is a case where the device is in, the things are, it's in perfect position, but the discs are splayed apart and there's not enough metal in the hole and there's a lot of spraying beside it. Um, some mitral valve repairs leak as well. This is a patient who has a mitral valve ring where the surgeon didn't reinforce the two edges that he sewed together well enough. And you can see that there's a dynamic hole here. In that situation, um, balloon sizing may actually be of help just to know that you're not putting in a device that's too small. Probably the right thing to do is just to really oversize the device. And again, this is another case where a duct occluder is very helpful. Uh, and you can see in that actually closed that fairly well. You know, a lot of these holes, as Wendy pointed out, have this real problem. They get this really sharp edge on one side and inevitably the wire sticks in the sharp edge and you cannot get it out of there. And as long as it's in the sharp edge, you can't get a sheath over it, right? Because it's just kind of in this V, this sharp V, the wire sticks in the V. You try and rotate, push, pull it out of there and you just can't and that's kind of your mechanism of failure. Um, in non-geometric defects where all our devices are circular except for the AVP3, sometimes it's helpful to actually, if you know you're going to need more than one device, get two wires down, put two sheets across, bang in two devices, you're done. Uh, this is an example of uh, just that over here. A lady with severe uh, paravalvular leak has two devices side by side. Uh, and actually there's no, um, no paravalvular leak afterwards at all on TE. Aortic interventions, the most important lesson I could tell you about aortic interventions is the, the first question I ask when someone calls me on the phone about the problem is, how tall is the patient? Because if the patient's 6'2 and they have a redundant aorta, we're not going to reach. So if you're going to go from the leg, you just run out of length. You just can't get across the aortic valve in a, a position to get across. So my favorite is a short guy with an aortic paravalvular leak. <laughs> Little guy, 5'2", five, 5'3", five, perfect, right? Um, this, is, um, this is something that is uh, related to this. This is um, someone who's had 
three double valve replacements, and extensive reconstruction of the aortic root with bovine pericardium. And the problem in this is, this is a different problem than a paravalvular leak. This is a fistula from the aorta into the left atrium. And the problem with these patients is, you get a great procedural result. So this is the, the ice here. We did this case with intracardiac echo. And the device looks great, but then five years later, you kind of get this continued degeneration of the patch and it just leaks severely. And at this point, there's kind of nothing to do. So you may have an initial success, but that patient was inoperable. This is an 82-year-old guy who had, a double, who had a bypass in 1980. He came back in 2010. He had a cabbage and AVR. They noticed the paravalvular leak in the operating room. He was treated medically at the time because they were concerned about having to do a bentol and they were concerned about bringing him back on pump. In the six months after surgery, he's had three episodes of congestive heart failure. His pulmonary pressures are normal, and he's turned down for redo surgery. And this is his aortogram, and I think there's a very, and this is his TE actually, and there's an important message to look here. In patients who are recently post-surgery, it's extremely important to define clearly, not with the transthoracic, what's leaking. Is it the valve that's leaking, or is it a paravalvular problem? So if you look at the cutaway here, you kind of get an idea right away that this is actually a paravalvular leak that's actually spraying into the outflow tract. And it's not a valvular problem. Because if you tabby that, you're obviously going to be very disappointed. So this is someone, this is a very easy procedure, by the way. You sling across the thing. It's usually quite easy to get across. You put in a device. In this case, we happened to use an AVP3. A while ago, we took a picture. It was still leaking. We put in another device beside it. And this guy actually does very, very well. Aortic paravalvular leak, fairly straightforward. A little bit more challenging in this procedure. Uh, this is a lady who had a TAVI. She's suitable for a 23 millimeter valve. She gets her TAVI. She's quite calcified. So first step in this is post-dilate. Post-dilate, the valve frame is bigger, but she's still got a big leak. So in this, a little bit more challenging than across, very difficult in core valve to get across. You can cross over four French catheter and you can put a couple of AVP4s across this and this actually works really, really well to reduce symptoms. And there's now been a lot reported on this at the time. Uh, this was relatively new. Now there's been a number of papers about how to do this and uh, fairly works fairly well. This is another situation of paravalvular leak that's dealt with slightly differently. This is a core valve that's way too low, very large annulus, 31 millimeter valve, where 31 millimeter core valve, difficult to handle beast, beast unpleasant. Um, in this case, it's too low. Uh, you know, you can't really close this uh, paravalvularly, but what you can do in this situation is actually put a big sapien valve in the waist, and that actually completely eliminates any regurgitation. So you drop a core valve too low, and you're in the waist, that tapered portion of the funnel for a paravalvular leak of that kind. This actually works very well. We've done that a number of times. So in summary, T and 3D echo provide critical support for per perivalvular interventions. Optimizing a procedure requires pre-planning, excellent communication, dedicated team, patient selections are critical elements, and little technical trips, uh, tip, uh, tricks are really important in this procedure. It's very fiddly, and um, sometimes you can save the day with the right suggestion. Thank you.